Bam, here we go. We're going to do a live, um, we're calling it a webinar. I don't really know if it's categorized as a webinar, but we're streaming it. And um, this all started where, where Raj and I, and I'll bring Raj to the stage here in a second, but um, Raj and Ramdahal is a, a, a very experienced mortgage broker that I've been working with for the last couple of years. When it comes to knowledge and just creativity, this guy, you know, is incredible and he and i have a lot of conversations about creative ways of financing different things that you know buyers are looking at and he services not only the the market in florida but also the market in new york and so i think his context is really important to to understand a little bit more about the market and so the conversation about two one buy downs three two one buy downs you know started happening with us a couple weeks back and we we're going to jump on a call and then as of today you know it rapidly um, occurred that we should probably make this into a stream and go live and actually share this with more people that can see it and uh, get some value out of it. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Rod, uh, Raj to the stage now. And what we'll do is uh, he has a display board that we can use some as a live, live demo for the way that he can put some calculations together as to how these two one buy downs work. And uh, I'm actually, I'm honestly done talking. I want to bring Raj in now. So here, <laughs> <laughs> here's Raj. Uh, hey, man. Thank you for doing this. I know I kind of threw you into the fire uh, over the last hour, but I pre appreciate your your support, it, man. It's a good thing I wore my nice uh, bright suit today, you know. <laughs> you did, man. But, it looks uh, great. But listen, I think I think it's awesome. I think it's a great time to talk about this topic because obviously people are concerned about rates, concerned about payments, concerned mm -hmm. about buying a house. Should I wait? The world's coming to an end, you know. Uh, so I think there's no better time to talk about a, a, a buy down than now because, you know, it's been out for, for a little while. Um, there wasn't a real need for it because, you know, when interest rates were in the sixes, even when it uh, touched in the sevens, it, it was still affordable. Right? right. Now we're starting to see rates in the eights. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But, you know, I think that rates are probably even going to tip maybe even closer to nine. Mm -hmm. And so I think. You know, these two ones and especially the three to one buy down is really going to help a lot of potential buyers to understand that there is still affordability in the market right now. And it's not over. The game is not over. So I really want to take some time and break that down just for people to see, you know, how a two one or a three one buy down works uh, from a realtor perspective, because I think a lot of realtors don't understand how to negotiate that seller's concession or that seller's contribution that right. goes to a buy down. And there's a big part about it that people don't understand that you can actually use some of that money and get refunded a portion of whatever you don't use. So right. in my opinion, in this market, a buy down is, is a win-win for everyone, for sellers, for buyers, for agents, for lenders, it's for everybody. Yeah. And, and like, uh, you know, so everyone that's watching this right now, we have a, a chat. So if you drop a question in that chat, uh, Raj or I will answer it. Um, we do have a segment at the end of it for Q&A. But if you drop that question in there, I know how Raj likes to talk and he will be able to address that in real time or whatever it is. So feel free to drop those in there. But just a few questions that we'll go through with Raj and I and starting with kind of the one that this is more of like an the way that I view the, the market, right? I'm, I'm optimistic from the approach of it. Rates are high. We know that, but I do this, do view this as a market for opportunity. And Raj and I, earlier, we had a call about investments that both of us are kind of looking at doing. And I think it'd be contrary to what a lot of the media is saying right now. It's like, don't buy. It's maybe not the right time to buy. So Raj, uh, as far as the current market, do you view it as we have opportunity or is it something like you're kind of holding your chips back and it's not a, a really good position? You know, for me personally, I whether it's potential clients, agents, investors, anyone I speak to, I am really showing them opportunity in this market. You know, I sat down with someone yesterday uh, that's self-employed, that's looking to buy multiple properties. And that's funny because that's the conversation I'm having more and more and more are people that are seeing that there is still opportunity. And here's why people think there is opportunity. Less competition, right? If we go back to, you know, COVID times, there was a ton of competition that was driven by rates. When that happens again and people feel that there's confidence in the market, that they think that because lower interest rates are going to mean that there's more affordability, cheaper monthly payments, they're all going to start running back into the market. And when that happens, we're going to see people competing, bidding wars, waiving all types of contingencies. And so naturally, prices are going to go higher. So for me, less competition means I can actually score a house 
at market price and maybe even below market price right now. That's my opinion. Um, and, and as I said, if you are a buyer, just look around. Investors are still buying, right? We talked mm -hmm. about, it, it, you know, I, I did a, a segment the other day. You look at all these major, major real estate firms nationally. They're not saying, hey, we're waiting. We're going to see where the market's going. No, they're, they're actively out there buying up tranches of properties, right? <laughs> because they understand if I keep taking them off the market, rent's going to continue to increase. Cash flow is going to continue to increase. But I'm essentially controlling the market. You as a potential first time home buyer, or if you already own a home and you're thinking about upgrading or buying another property, the longer you wait, it, in my personal opinion, the worse it's going to be because when that rate comes down to 6% or 5%, but that property price goes up 75,000, a hundred thousand, you're actually going to be paying more and you're going to be paying more for the life of the loan. Yeah. And, and that's, I think why this whole like two, one buy down conversation starts because I, I I don't think a, a lot of people really know about this um, the, this program or the incentive, or however you want to kind of discuss it. But um, you know, everyone just looks at what the rates are and they think that that's the rate and that's what they they deal with. They don't know all these other options until they start having either the conversations with their agent or their mortgage broker, or they see something like this online, which is uh, you know obviously the reason why we wanted to do this earlier before we jumped on the call. You know, we were like, what is the whole purpose of this? What's the call to action? It's like, it's, it's none of that. We just want to provide a little bit of education and some, you know, knowledge to you guys to where you can arm yourselves with another option for your clients. Or if you are on the buying side, something else that you should be considering. So let's just like jump right into it, Raj. So we talked about kind of can what I, we're seeing in the market. You want to jump and in? I'm, and I'm doing an impromptu because I want to, I want to get Go. your take on it because there are a lot of people that are going to look at you, Shane, and they're going to say, well, as an agent, how do I how do I run this by my seller? Like, how do I convince my seller that they should give a concession and, and give it towards a two one buy down? And that's it's a two part question. That's the first thing. The second thing is, do you think convincing an agent, like if you're putting in an offer in and they know that you're seeking a seller's concession, does the mindset of that agent and that seller change because they think that maybe the buyer isn't qualified, so they need to buy down the rate? And I'll explain a little bit about that, but from an agent's perspective, right? Like how, how do you think dealing with sellers would, that would work? I think, um, it's a conversation that more agents are having with their sellers now than they have in the past, uh, because we haven't really had to deploy strategies like this. So I've even seen it to the level of where it's advertised to the, in the public remarks on the listing, such as like the narrative where it would say, you know, seller is willing to entertain two and buy down, but then they don't apply any context because most people are like, what the, what the fuck is that? Right. <laughs> so I don't think that that's as helpful. And the agent remarks is another clever space that I've seen people put it where Essentially, what it does is from the agent side, it, it lets us know that the seller is maybe a little bit knowledgeable about what this is and they would be open to it. But at the end of the day, the conversation with the seller is, look, you can either pay for, you know, concessions in the format of are you helping them buy their closing costs down? Are you going to offer concessions for repairs or this two one buy down? Like it's all kind of the same viewership from the seller because it's it's eliminating their net proceeds. And that's essentially how the conversation should be done and, and has been done in the past for us, especially when it comes to concessions or other things that sellers are providing for that buyer. So I think it's as simple as that. I'm just happy to see that other agents and sellers are aware of something like this. Even, you know, I'll admit it here, like I don't know a ton about it and it's not actually something that I have had my buying clients use in, and I couldn't even tell you how long, um, where it's like something that I'm like looking at it as this is really good option and a really good thing that, that buyers could use now to help bring down the cost of, of your mortgage. And to me, it sparks interest in, mm -hmm. in, in that person's property, right? Because more yeah. buyers now are going to feel like they have opportunity because the seller is willing to cooperate, willing to help. Right? So to me, it creates a buzz for the buyer to say, okay, well, look, I'm interested in this property because I know the seller is flexible. The other part about it is from the seller side, I think if it allows the property to kind of just not sit there and you yeah. can kind of really move that property really quickly, it really gets you that price and closer to that top price of what you want. So like I said, from a buyer side, it's a win from a seller side, it's a win. So for sure, let's, let's get into the numbers. Um, so I can break it down. You'll tell me if you can see my screen here. Yeah, Raj has um, a really cool screen. He's been ultra <laughs> excited to get, get this thing going. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna add it to the stage. This is gonna be really cool because Raj is gonna be able to do math in real time. 
we're actually going to be able to see his penmanship too. So people are going to look at this. Oh my God. It's actually really good. <laughs> it's better than I expected. <laughs> yeah, it's much better than mine. Wow. So, uh, so right, okay. what are we looking at here? So basically, and, and I can't really see you, but you can see my board, right? So yeah. we're starting off with the loan amount at 400,000, right? So we have a buyer that's got a loan amount of about $400,000. Now, as of yesterday, the current market rate we're going to use is 8%. And that's crazy. I know a lot of people, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. But I wanted to break down what the principal and interest payments were going to be. And essentially how we get to what you need to negotiate as a seller's concession for your, 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 your seller and your buyer, right? So mm -hmm. if we were to use an interest rate of 8%, okay? That's what today's market is. That is what is considered your final rate. So if we were going to do a three, two, one buy down, that would mean after the third year, your interest rate for the rest of the loan is going to be at 8%. Okay. That would put you at a principal and interest payment of $2,935 and six cents. Now, if we were to start at, at your first year of a three, uh, three, two, one buy down, your rate would be at a 5% interest rate. That means your principal and interest is $2,147.29, which is pretty nice, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you factor in taxes and insurance, I mean, you're almost looking at about, you know, a $750 uh, savings a month from what your final interest rate would be to what your beginning interest rate is. is. So it's nice to have that $700 a month saving for the first year of your mortgage. The second year, your interest rate would be at 6%, okay? That principal and interest payment is $2,398.20. Again, you're looking at about, you know, 500 and change savings um, at your second year. From your third year, you're at $2,661.21. That's at a 7% interest rate. So you see what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. Your first year of your mortgage, you're starting out with a payment based off of a 5% interest rate. Second year, your payment's based off of a 6% interest rate. Third year, your interest rate and payment is based off of a 7%. And then from your fourth year on, you're at an 8% interest rate. So does that make sense so far for you, Shane? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get into the cost of it. And of course, like the whole refi side of it, because I think that's another component where people probably, you know, are like, oh, I have to, I'm stuck with 8% at that point. What if rates are better? So that's, an, I'm sure you'll tee that up. But yeah, I mean, exactly. that makes sense. I can actually exactly. see how the three to one adds up and makes sense from a subtraction standpoint. I mean, listen, if, if I'm a buyer and, 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 and I'm looking at affordability, right? If I know my, my, my principal and interest payment is at 2,100 versus 2,900. So if we were to even just tack in some taxes and insurance, right? Like if we put $100 for insurance and $200 for taxes, you know, someone buying a $400,000 uh, mortgage, right? I mean, you're talking about a monthly payment of what? The 2,447? Mm -hmm. that's, that's still very affordable in in this market at, at least as a first-time buyer that gives me a lot more hope than if my payment were to be 32 or 3300 right that's a that's a pretty significant difference so you see right now how that three two one buy down works where you're really benefiting from the first three years of that mortgage and having yeah. that below market payment yeah, now totally makes sense how we work out what your seller's concession needs to be is also a very important question, right? Because we need to know, well, how do we tell the sellers how much money we need? So if you notice to the right here, I used a, a breakdown. And so really what you're doing is you're taking all of the savings from the first three years compared to what your final payment's gonna be. And when you take all those payments, you uh, multiply it by 12, so you get what the annual savings are, you add it all up. So if you notice at, the uh at the first one here your total annual savings would have been nine thousand four hundred fifty three dollars the first year your second year your total savings is six thousand four hundred forty two dollars thirty two cents third year three thousand two hundred eighty six dollars and twenty cents which brings you to nineteen thousand one eighty one seventy six so that is how much we need as a seller's concession for the seller to contribute towards a three two one buy down for a four hundred thousand dollar uh uh, loan amount. Okay. Is and that, that, and yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, I've heard other uh, lenders use like a, a percentage rate of it. I don't know if it's because it was a rounded number or what. Is that a. So here's the thing that you could do. So now let's just say for argument's sake, 
uh, you used a 5%, right? So if we know that we need 19,181, well, you mm -hmm. can negotiate a 5% concession from your seller, right? So yeah. the 5,000 of 400 is gonna be 20,000. 19,181 is going to go specifically to the buy down and the additional, let's say $900 or $1,000 can go to other closing costs. So in this scenario, if, if I'm on the, the, I'll use the buying side and right. um, someone in this call is on the listing side, I bring a, a buyer through, I need to write that contract and put in concessions of, of about $20,000 for the seller to pay for my, to my lender for the buy down. Is that correct? Correct. Exactly. So if you want, you could put, you know, a 5% concession again, the math, you can see it right there. Now, another thing that they can do. And I've seen a lot of people do it, um, especially, you know, we do a lot of these in New York because we have a lot higher price points, right? So the savings mm -hmm. are greater. That's why the, the buy downs are really popular out here. But I see people negotiate a 6% concession, which in this case would have been 24,000. Out of that 24,000, 19,000 goes to the buy down and the remainder goes to the closing cost. So okay. you can also do that. So it's, it's a nice creative way to kind of help the buyer out. Um, but as I said, you can negotiate directly, you know, a 5% concession, or you can go even higher. And so it looks like at the bottom of your screen, you have a, like a two, one buy down. I'm, I'm sure is okay. There we go. Yep. So again, I did the math. If you were to do a two, one buy down, as opposed to a three, one, buy, three, two, one buy down, then you would only need 9,728.52. So then you can negotiate a $10,000 concession from the seller. Which seems like a lot easier kind of. Log the yes. two on. I don't, I don't know why yes. I said log. And, and again, there's still significant savings there because if we noticed, if your payment is at the first, and again, I'll just bring this, pull this back up. So if you look at it here, if you were to do a two one buy down, so your first year you're starting at a 6% interest rate, you're still $500 in change in savings. And mm -hmm. in your second year, you're at a 7%. So you're still at about $300 or close to $300 in savings. So it still provides a saving for the buyer. And from a seller's perspective, it's not like you're going with a whole ton of money that you've got to take a haircut by, right? Like you just said, ten thousand dollars is, is a much easier sell than maybe mm -hmm. twenty thousand. Yeah, but I can see how how that's really helpful. Um, before we kind of talk about the whole, you know, option of of refinancing out of it or whatever it looks like. I mean, something we talked about before we jumped on the show is um, right now there's probably people that are like, hey, why don't I just get the the seller to to buy my rate down or, or buy points, right? So again, if we were to just look at it from just a regular concession, so someone might be saying to themselves, well, why, why even do a three, two, one buy down? If I could get a $10,000 concession from the seller, why don't I just use it to just pay points and then yeah. have that concession basically eat up whatever it is that I'm paying for points. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And if you look at the theory though, you'll see that typically one point, which is 1% of your loan amount will buy down your interest rate by about a quarter point. Okay. So, I mean, if you were to pay two points, let's say, and you get a half a percent or a half a point in savings, if the market rate's at 8%, that's only bringing you down to about a seven and a half percent interest rate. And I even did the numbers on that. Your, your payment, if you were to be at a seven seven and a half percent interest rate is $2,796. So it's not a significant amount of savings if you think about it, because now if you're almost at 2,800 and you're actual interest rate would have been at 8% and the payment would have been 2,900, you're, you're only saving about $135 or $140. That's it. Whereas that same $10,000 could have gone towards doing a two one buy down and you would have been saving your first year, right? You're yeah. saving almost 500 and change a month. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, I mean, definitely a huge savings there. And have you seen with a lot of the loans that you guys are writing, are, are these becoming more prevalent? Are you seeing a lot more of these now than ever before or what's the- Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Especially I could tell you recently within the last, I would say maybe week and a half to two weeks, I mean, almost every contract that's coming in is negotiated based on some form of a concession for a buy down. Um, sellers understand we need to give buyers incentives to buy properties, right? Sellers, and, and as I mentioned, Look at the months that we're coming up to, right? We're coming up to November, December, January, February, which yep. typically, at least over here, are the slower months. Sellers don't want to sit with carrying costs over the next three to four months. And then what happens is if that listing is there for the next three to four months, it gets stale. 
Um, most buyers, most agents, when they come in, buyers, agents, they're going to say, hey, this listing is kind of old. We're going to really try to negotiate down. So it's yeah. a way for, I think, sellers to kind of get ahead of it, create the incentive, create the buzz, and you know, kind of give that buyer the incentive of, of buying their property. I think it's very smart. How do you think with the loans that you're getting, like how do you think the buyers are aware of of that opportunity? Is it because they're working with you and you're like, hey, you guys should be doing this? Or is it just because in the New York market, maybe it's like more com common up there because of prices? So what I will say is this, um, a lot of it is based on agent knowledge um, because a lot of the agents are well aware and well versed about the buy downs. And so when they're meeting with potential buyers or even with us um, as a loan officer, right? When we're pre-approving clients and we're sitting with them, we throw this out as an option to bring it to their attention because most buyers aren't aware of this. Um, they don't know how it works. They don't know about the buy downs. And so when we pre uh, present it to them and say, well, look, you know, you could be at 2% or 3% below where market rate is right now. I mean, it's just like, it's the best thing since sliced bread for them. So we see that agents are also, you know, pushing this, this product out there because it makes sense. They're educating it. Listing agents are more educated about it as well. So just in conversation now, there's a better understanding of buy downs from all sides. Yeah. And I don't feel like I heard about this a lot um the last couple of years specifically and i can pull off the board if you're done with that guy yeah yeah we'll do this little guy look at look how cool we look um but i, I feel like uh the two one wasn't really popular last year uh or the year before and i feel like this is something that you know broaches when rates are getting a little bit higher than what people are used to is that pretty accurate well i think what it is is you know sellers didn't really have a reason because the market still was was pretty decent right like i said yeah. there was still a decent amount of activity when rates were in the sixes and sevens um buyers were still willing to buy at that well now when you're at seven and a half and eight and and again we're going to be approaching higher than that the mindset of a buyer is very different and and as we start to see just even naturally the slower months of real estate the people that really need to sell have to get creative and this is where that creativity comes in to, to bring buyers back to the market, to let them know that, look, it's not over. Yeah. You use these tools and it creates the affordability, right? So that's that's why we're seeing so much popularity in it once again. For sure. Um, and anyone that's watching right now, I'm only really monitor on the side. So if you are in the webinar, you can ask some questions in there. So go ahead and drop, drop the questions in the comments if you have anything. I was trying to log on to any of the other streaming sites that we're on so we're on facebook and youtube right now and i'm just like there's a thousand things going on at once i'm just <laughs> sorry if you're dropping questions in there uh yeah. you're on your own we'll answer it later but um no i think you you described to, you know the the buy down really easy to understand i don't think i had seen it like that i guess i didn't realize it was the savings that they were getting each year uh and then depending if it's three two one or two one you know the combination of, and that is the cost for the seller i guess i never understood it like that so if there are other people like me um, or maybe I'm the only one that just was that simple. But uh, thank you, man. Thanks for explaining it. <laughs> and, and, we didn't talk about, and we didn't talk about the fact of, which I really want to also hone in on, um, and I hope I'm not jumping the gun here, about yeah. the, the the benefit of if, let's say, and, and we have to understand something because people think that, oh, my God, rates are going to be like this forever. If you look at every uh, analysis that's out there, every study, right, yeah. we understand that the market and the Fed's even the feds themselves have signaled that they want to start reducing rates somewhere within the next, you know, the end of 2024. So we're talking about within the next year to year and a half, we should start to see rates come down. And based on even their analysis, they're looking to be aggressive with bringing rates back down in that manner, just like how they rose it. So what that means to you as a, as a potential buyer that's using a 2-1 buy down, what you can do is, so if a year and a half from now, you used a three, two, one buy down, right? Okay. Whatever portion we saw that that was nineteen thousand dollars. If after a year and a half you choose to refinance, or even at two years you choose to refinance because interest rates have come down significantly to where it makes sense, that portion that's unused in that buy down, you get a refund of that money when you refinance. Uh, so, so can, can you draw that? Can you draw that on your fancy little board? Can you, okay, I'll make it even easier, right? So little, let's look I'm at- I'm gonna bring it back on. Is it on there? Let me know. I'm gonna bring it back in. Raj just wants to show his board, his board again. 
All right, All right, so you're saying the remaining balance that's left over if they decide to refinance inside that three years um, right. is essentially like a, a positive balance one would have, right? So now let's look at, let's say we just did a, a let's say we did a three, two, one buy down, right? So we okay. know, you can see it, right? It cost, the savings was 9,453.24 the first year. The second year, the savings was 6,442.32, right? So again, I'm using just easy numbers. So let's say it's 10,000 and and 6,500, right? So we're talking 16,500 in savings. So here's the thing. If after those two years, you refinance and you don't need that third year, well, now you get a refund of 3,286.20 coming back to you, mm -hmm. which you saved money the first two years yeah. and you got extra money that came back to you the third year. And so, so you're the, using that that savings to for the closing costs on the refi, or was you that use it for the, yeah, exactly. You use it for the for the closing costs on the refi. So at the end of the day, you're you're really getting the full benefit of that buy down. And a lot of people don't know that that you no. do get that unused portion because people think, oh well, if I refinance in two years, then I lost all that the extra money and and it went to nothing. Like it just was wasted. It's not. You actually do get that money back. So what it is, it's 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 set up in an escrow account, and this is uh, taking it a step further so people can understand. When you do a two one buy down at closing or a three two one buy down at closing, an escrow account gets established, and that money gets put into there. And every year and every month when that payment needs to be made, money comes out of that account. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, once whatever is not used is remaining, you get a refund back of that portion of money. That's awesome. So yeah, you get the full benefit of it uh, at the time of, of purchase. So it's actually cash that could be used for that. And I think, you know, I was gonna, I was trying to pull up some, some graphics too, to see if we could show forecasts of, of 2024 of what it is. You, you, I start seeing like a mixed opinions on it. And that'll be one of the, the last things we talk about Raj is like your predictions on it, but we're seeing a lot of mixed um, predictions as to what 2024 is going to entail, whether we're going to see rates continue to increase or you have people that are like, no, we're going to park. We're going to see five to six. But I think from a, you know, everyone that you talk to, everyone is like, well, there's not a chance in hell we're ever going to see two or three percent, four percent would be a godsend, but five percent is probably going to be the most relief we'll see. And that might take a really long time uh, for that to happen. So do you want to kind of forecast your projections and yeah. predictions? Yeah, I mean, listen, a healthy real estate market rate is somewhere between four and six percent. I definitely believe that we'll, we'll probably never, ever see twos and threes again. I think it was yeah. just a, an anomaly or a, a one time thing. And that's it. Um, based on, on, on the projections that I've seen and what I believe. I mean, look, I study the market. I look at these uh, data points that come out right um, with inflation, with how the market's going. Um, like I talked about PPI, um, CPI. Looking at these things, we see that inflation is cooling off from year over year, which means we're headed in the right direction. The reason why the feds are still kind of keeping their foot a little bit on the gas and probably are going to raise rates again is because they really want to make sure that at the end of the day, they bring inflation down because we see these pops in numbers that are still a little bit higher than they like it to be, right? So what they really want to do is make sure that at the end of the day, when they pivot and they go into the mode of wanting to start to reduce interest rates, that they want to know that they've actually tamed inflation. And right now, they, they haven't fully accomplished that. And so I believe that, uh, again, if you look at the 10-year, if you look at the economy, it's still a little too healthy for where they feel comfortable. There's still a lot of jobs being added. Consumers are still spending. And so what the feds really want to do is raise interest rates. I think they're probably going to raise at least by another quarter or a half uh, of a percent, probably over the next two to three months. At that point, we're going to be pushing eight and a half closer to 9%. I think that's the point where we're going to see everything come down to where they want it to be at. And I think probably, like I said, by the end of 2024, we might even start to see a little bit of a reduction back in interest rates. So you think it's going to take that long for for the relief to happen? We're talking Q4 of 2024, where we start seeing any real like true break in rates. And I think that here's why, because the Fed's concern is if they if they react too early and they think the market's going to be, you know, happy to see that they're pivoting. Once they pivot, 
they know the market's going to take that in a way of again they're going to they're going to be happy about it we're going to start seeing people spending money again we're going to start seeing the stock market soar and they don't want to preemptively do that and then all of a sudden there's a huge pop back in inflation and then they're going to have to change course again they don't want to go like that that's why they keep talking about this soft landing if you ever hear yeah. the, the feds yeah. they keep talking about a soft landing a soft landing right so they would rather keep raising rates really make sure that they've tamed inflation and then pivot so that basically everyone else will understand what direction they're moving in and the market will digest it better. No, I get the soft landing makes you know a ton of sense and I'm, I'm throwing the comments in as, as we, I see them, but Jennifer, thanks for, for the, for uh, saying Raj is great. She's definitely talking to you also, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so soft landing makes a ton of sense because I think it's the last thing that anyone wants to see is all this happen again. Um, but but definitely interesting to kind of track with what's happening with rates and what we're all doing to kind of try to generate business. I think, um, you know, before we we jumped on the live, we were talking like, what's what's it look like in your market and what are you guys doing and and how it is? And I think, you know, Florida has been a little bit insulated from a lot of these other economic issues that are happening to a point to where it's like we're not we have not been affected as some of the larger states when and states with with higher prices right new york california um even parts of texas things like that but we're definitely at a point now where things are slower and I, i'm more listing heavy than really anything else so i'm feeling it now in the format of you know my listings are just taking a little bit longer to sell we have to have you know more high level conversations with our sellers about what we're doing the marketing the, to prop the property and you know showcasing insights and all these other things that agents that entered the market over the last 24 months are unaware of because at that point like it was it was you know relatively easy to be a good agent right you listed anything and it sold fast because we weren't really dealing with a lot of issues whereas now like the baseline that i think seasoned agents look at is pre covid levels so look at mm -hmm. september look at october of 2020 look what the inventory levels were there for your area and then compare it to where you're at now and i'd be willing to bet that in most locations your inventory levels are probably within 20% of what it looked like in september or october of 2020 and that's kind of what we're basing everything off of as far as like how to have these conversations because back then raj i don't know if you were in the florida market as much but it was still taking 30 to 45 days in 2020 for you know average listings to sell in brevard county mm -hmm. yeah yeah I i'm pretty aware of that i mean i wasn't fully down there like i am now right. i did have real estate down there and i i remember it it it, it definitely like you said 30 40 days was normal. It's not like the three days and five days off the market where it was Unreal. a couple of years ago, you know? Unreal, man. So um, I think like you just said, though, it, it really puts a spotlight on agents that now have to know their craft, mm -hmm. have to actually know their numbers and have to do their due, due diligence and be creative in getting these properties moved, right? Um, and, and, and I don't know if that's something you want to get into, but I could tell you, especially over here, you know, the non-QM, the non-traditional mortgage aspect, I mean, we have just seen those numbers increase, increase, increase in volume. Um, because now you you have self-employed buyers. Right. Only that fans. Have volume, that have the means because the products are there. And so they're coming out now because they're not, they're not phased like a W-2 wage earner. They're not really phased by a seven percent or six percent or an eight percent they just want to be able to buy yeah. and so especially out here a ton of the activity is based on non-qm uh buyers you know self-employed buyers that are out there buying whether do you, it's do you want to talk buyers, about the non-qm though because i don't feel like a lot of people under like i didn't know what that was until what like six months ago five months ago <laughs> so, i mean if you want to like talk about that too it's a whole direction we could go but maybe just briefly explain non-qm so basically they're non-traditional products, right? Um, they're geared towards more self-employed investor uh, buyers, um, whether you're buying you know, a primary residence as a self-employed buyer or you're buying investment properties. People are very familiar with like the DSCR program where you're using the uh, rental income from the property to qualify for the mortgage. So you're not even looking at tax returns and pay stubs and any of those things that you would in a traditional aspect to qualify to buyer. Um, and again, even if you're buying your primary residence, right? <laughs> Even if you're buying your primary residence uh, as a, as a self-employed buyer, if you're going the traditional route, a lot of times you've got so many uh, write-offs 
on your tax returns that you know your net is very little and so you can't qualify the traditional route but you really make the money so with a non-qm or a non-traditional product you can qualify using a profit and loss on a balance sheet you can qualify using a 1099 you could qualify using the average deposits uh, in your bank statements. You can do a combination, what we call like an asset depletion, where we can use the gross money that you have in the bank and we break it down and use that as a monthly income. So there is so much opportunity for self-employed borrowers that have money, have the means, but in most cases, they didn't you know, qualify because like I said, they were going the traditional route. And if you didn't file your tax returns or amend it or do whatever it was to show the income, then you really didn't qualify. So, I mean, again, we are seeing more and more uh, self-employed borrowers come into the market now uh, feeling empowered because now yeah. they have all these products. Um, and But that's also why it's really important that, you know, you have to work with someone that knows these products. Like for me, I've been doing non-traditional mortgages almost close to eight years now. A lot of people only know about it in the last year or two because it's become so popularized uh, nationwide. Um, but a lot of agents don't really know how it works and a lot of lenders don't know how it works. So that's, that's something that for me, you know, I, I, I really love talking about it because I think it's just so misunderstood. And I think if more agents kind of added it to their, to their tool belt, you would see how much more business you could, be, you could really generate. And then to be like play devil's advocate, and I don't know enough context about this, but, but, um, non QM seems like a really good option, like almost like too good of an option to be true because of people that maybe don't have like you said their taxes filed or whatever whatever it is um but the, on the negative side of it i mean is it relatively easy to get a loan so could that create a problem where maybe people get these loans based on maybe they have a shit ton of money in their savings at one point and then all of a sudden they get this loan and then their only fans accounts you know goes nowhere and then they're screwed like where what does that look like in the i mean i just so they, no, that. and I'm, that's a great question because yeah. I've heard a lot of people say, well, we're basically stepping back into like 2008, right? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're opening Pandora's box once again. Mm -hmm. And the difference between then and now was when you had these no income products back then, and I was fortunate enough to be in the industry then, so I understand it. But when you open up Pandora's box back then, you had people that were able to buy homes using no income verification products that can still do 100% financing or 106% financing back in those days. So there was very little skin in the game. And, uh, and from a credit score requirement, you could have had a 600 credit score and utilize a product like that. So if you have very little skin in the game, very little investments, it's easy to walk away from something like that. The reason why these products are so effective and they're so popular is because they perform. If you look at the mortgage-backed securities and hedge funds that uh, bundle these loans, you know these are almost close to AAA type of products because if someone's putting down 20, 25, 30%, the chances of them walking away from that property or even defaulting on that property is very, very slim. You've got you know more of a chance of people defaulting on your typical FHAs or conventional products because again, they have lower credit score requirements and they have lower down payment requirements so it's easier for those people, unfortunately, to kind of just walk away from a property like that. Again, you and I could speak to it. If I've got 20 to 30 percent invested into a property, I'm damn sure going to see how I can make that payment or sell that property or do something to keep it afloat. I'm not just going to walk away from it. And I, I think I probably know the answer to this, but with a non QM, is there an option of a three, two, one or a two, one buy down? So there is not a three, two, one right now. Recently, they came out with a two-one buy down, so it is an option to do a okay. two-one buy down. Um, but there are other ways that you can look at it, where you can use prepayment penalties as a way of buying down your interest rates. Um, I think in most cases, investors that are doing, let's say, a DSCR or something like that, is not really going to focus on buying down your rate. Maybe if you're buying it as a primary residence, yes, I can see where you can use a, a two-one or a three-two-one buy down for something like that. So to answer your question, yes there are options to do buy downs on the non-QM products. Okay. And even, you know, this is a whole nother topic we didn't really plan on discussing, but um, you know, I'm a recent candidate of a, of a non-QM, right. And from the investment side of things too, I think for agents that are trying to get into investments, like this is a really good option for me to experiment with and, and sort of learn and understand. But from a mortgage standpoint, I mean, it did seem 
like a breeze. I just feel like the guy that was applying for the loan was a little bit more of a pain in the ass than, than he should have been. But um, overall, like I would say that the documentation that you needed from me for that non QM was, was probably about 15% of what I would normally have to provide for another loan. Now here's the thing. And, and, and to my self-employed buyers, right. Or, or clients that are out there, think about this. If you've got multiple properties, you've got to make sure you've got your tax returns in place. You've mm. got to have your corporate returns. You got to have your personal returns. In most cases, you got to make sure that your account knows what they're doing and they're, you know, they're filing a schedule E, right? They're claiming the depreciation. They're claiming the rent rule. They're claiming all those things. So that when you go for a mortgage, the mortgage company can add back in those things to basically wash out what your monthly payment is, right? right. So when you think about it from a self-employed perspective, you've got to go through so much loopholes. I mean, uh, or requirements, I should say, not loopholes, but you've got to go through so much more requirements and provide so much more paperwork when you're going through a traditional mortgage. And any one of those things that gets missed, like if this year you wanted to really pass through a loss because you wanted to really cut down on the amount of income that you're showing, right? So you can, you know, again, not have to pay a ton of taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, now that can work against you because you claimed a huge loss. And if you're going for a traditional mortgage, now we've got to take that loss into account. So there's so many ways where unfortunately for self-employed borrowers, when you go the traditional route, there it, it's this huge obstacle for you to get a mortgage. Yeah. On the non-traditional way, like I said, in most cases, you're not even looking at tax returns. You're not having to provide income documentation, right? You're either getting a 1099 from your CPA or you're getting your CPA to provide a profit and loss on a balance sheet or you're getting bank statements. That's right. it. And your credit. And the beauty from, from an investor perspective is that now these properties can be bought with an, uh, under an LLC. So you don't have to think about, well, after I close, then I've got to do a quick claim deed and get it into an LLC, but then it's still on my credit. So eventually I'm going to have to refinance and get it off my credit. No, you can actually buy these properties straight under your LLC. So you don't even have to worry about doing that in the future. Yeah. And that's, that's what we just talked about too. So these other properties I own, we've bought them with investment loans, but they're under my wife and I's name uh, because, because there's a mortgage on that. So with a non-QM gives you opportunity to put it into an entity. I thought that was another really cool thing. That was a, that was a tangent. I didn't think we expected to go on. Um, I'm going to try to soft land this webinar uh, if, if I can with Raj. So one of the last things to go into uh, was looking for questions here. <laughs> I like that one. I, I don't know how that one better. goes. I think you would be better than me. <laughs> I don't even know what I would, uh, what do you, I've never been on OnlyFans. I don't know what I'd showcase, wow, but. Wow, wow. <laughs> uh, Raj, please don't ever do that again. I don't know what happened. We, we lost, people, we lost Raj. <laughs> no, he's bad. Hey, you just really um, me out, right? <laughs> so I use uh, Mortgage News Daily primarily for like my data resource for mortgages and you get the notifications about rates are up down up down up down i like i like that app actually I'm, 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 i would promote it if if they paid me more um but is there a resource that you would suggest for agents or consumers to where they can kind of look and see what's going on with the the rates so i mean for me I, again i love mortgage news daily because it gives you a lot of articles it gives you a lot of insight for you know someone that is still somewhat under trying to understand the market. Like I use MBS Live that has a lot to do with Barry Habib. Um, if you know him, he is really well versed in understanding the 10 year, understanding. Um, and it's funny because I would love to even show you sometime what it looks like. They have these charts and they plot it out. And just like a stock, they look at, you know, ceiling and floors. And you'll see that if it breaks to a certain number, which is a ceiling, then you have an uptick to where you know the bond can go even higher and higher. For the for the average Joe, I would say take a look at your ten year Treasury. Right, if you see the number, which I think today is hovering somewhere around four ninety four ninety, if you see that number going higher, you know interest rates are going higher. If you see that number going lower, then you know interest rates are going lower. Um, but definitely, Mortgage News Daily is great. MBS Live, if you really want to get into it because you can see live updates from lenders and how they're repricing throughout the day so you can know where rates are going uh as i said they, pro they provide uh charts that you can see future dots and, and and where the predictions are for rates based on like if it was a stock looking at it seeing where ceiling and floors are and uh what breakthroughs are so uh i think for me mbs is great mortgage news daily is another great great tool 
Yeah, man. I mean, that's that's awesome. I was actually trying to look up um, to see if we can get this little diagram. I don't know if I can like take us off the screen without really messing things up, but but I was able to find. I can't do this. It's just too far outside of my. Oh wow! Now it's bringing your other guy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> But the background is, is mortgage rates and it's today's rates. So if you're able to kind of Google that um, MBS Live or mortgage, this is from Mortgage News Daily. What they yep. do is they show you a ticker basically every day to see what rates are doing. And it and it's also really nice too, because it will give you context all the way back to like this chart here is 2014. So you can kind of see what 2014 looked like. You see the this huge plummet in rates, and obviously most people understand that that was pandemic time, and then this increase, and then the volatility that we've seen over the last, you know, really like year and a half. So it's it's interesting to track. It's one of my favorite apps. I'm not a I'm not a notification guy, but that is one of the apps that I have notification on for um for things like that, so I can track it in real time. Uh, one of the last questions, Raj, before we kind of get this thing off. I can't believe we're almost pushing an hour on that. We're at 46 minutes. You know that. I think we should do this more often, man. I kind yeah. of really like it. That was pretty, man, you're, you're awesome. You're a natural, dude. Uh, if I could just <laughs> figure figure out how to use this service. I like that background. You like that better than the, the, the beach I one? I think it's cool. It looks like we're on the news, honestly. That's what I was going to say, right? It looks like this, uh, you know, broadcast. Um, all right, so this one, the last one. So we're kind of out of sequence here, but as as far as like us agents go, you did ask me kind of like what we do to to – promoted or advertise it do you have any suggestions in terms of three two one buy down yeah in terms of the buy down i get to go back to our initial kind of combo i i mean for me personally i i think the way i advertise it is that there's still hope in the market it's it's about helping buyers to understand that there is still affordability i think if we can show them how they can get a two percent or a three percent lower rate than where the market rate is, it gives them hope. That's all buyers need to understand. The, the biggest problem is that buyers don't know that these options are out there. And so being able to explain to them, buyers, do you know that you can start with an interest rate 3% below where current market rates are? If I were a buyer and I heard something like that, of course it's gonna intrigue me. And of course it's gonna make me wanna ask the question, how? That's what agents need to do. Agents need to show buyers and, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a fan of down payment assistance. And I, I understand a lot of people, you know, they talk about it. But to me, a down payment assistance is not the same thing like showing them affordability. Because unfortunately, consumers out there look at the news and they're heavily dependent on interest rates to make certain decisions, right? So if they see an interest rate at 8% in their mind automatically, I'm not buying right now. But if you can show them 8%, but you're going to start at five, well, now I want to know how, how that works, right? How, how can I afford now to buy a house when my rate starts in the fives? So I think as agents, you need to go out there. You need to advertise that there are options that bring affordability back to home buyers. Um, and so I think if you put that out there, do a snippet like this. You know, take a blackboard, just break the numbers down, show them this is what your payment would be right now after three years or two years. And this is where your starting is. I think that will help a lot of people out there to, to get them back to the market. Definitely. I, th I think that's why we wanted to do this because the visual aspect of seeing what the savings look like, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm a alert. I'm a visual learner where I think most I think it's the, the most amount of people. It's like 70 percent of people learn from, from visually. Um, so I think that was really helpful. Something that we were kind of kicking around yesterday was was almost on like per listing database where you could get a scenario based on the price point what it would look like at current rates and then with the buy down and have like a almost like a preliminary sort of like a adjustment schedule for that and then mm -hmm. use that in some of your marketing efforts whether it's a photo on the listing or it's a document that maybe lives on the mls as a doc thing it, these aren't things that i've done but i'm thinking about it my marketing brain is turning around where i'm like how can we sort of promote this to where it becomes blatantly obvious to to buyers in the public space, like, oh shit, this is a buy down. I feel like, dude, Raj, we should do that on i uh, I've got a listing in the neighborhood that we should do that on where we show the three, two, one buy down at, Absolutely. yeah, at 885 price. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, no. and I'll put it as like picture number two on the MLS until I get fined or someone tells me. <laughs> to do it. And then I'll report back and let you guys know if it worked, if it was helpful and how many people got pissed off at me. <laughs> but I definitely think showing buyers um, especially like you just said, in advertising, 
-hmm. and whatever you're putting out on social media, if you can show them, hey, this is the price, this is where market rate is and your payment, this is what your market, uh, your payment could be. And, and I think that would drive a huge amount of traction to people saying, oh, wow, like I didn't realize that I can, I could actually have that payment. Now, now, all of a sudden, when I thought that I couldn't really afford it, well, I really can, right? And I mean, most buyers are okay with kicking the can down the line. What I mean by that is they're okay with saying, well, hey, if I can afford the property for the first two, three years, well, you know what? I'll deal with whatever comes down the future three years, four years from now, right? Yeah, no, man, for sure. Uh, and I love I I was relatively surprised to hear about the savings that you can kind of roll that into whatever you decide to do um, in the three years, whether it's a refinance or not. Because I think the reality is, and I'd, I'd be so curious to see the the data and stats on this, but but people that are pulling the trigger on a three, two, one buy downs right now, I bet more than 75% of those people refi, maybe even higher inside that shit. It should oh, be everywhere. I, I I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt because if you look at where the market is, you understand, and we talked about it. There's no way that the Feds are going to hold out on rates for the next three years. It's it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Right. So even if your worst case is it's two years from now, we're still within that three year window where you're going to refi anyway. And that's why I say about with buyers right now, you're not going to you you know you're at a high price point with rates right now. You know you're going to refi, but at least I would rather be the guy that buys the house now for six hundred thousand at a seven or eight percent interest rate with a buy down, and refinance in two years when rates come down to five, let's say. But I'd rather be that guy than the one running out to try to buy a house a year or two from now when rates come down to five. But there's so much competition that you're bidding and bidding and bidding, and that six hundred thousand dollar house I'm paying seven seven twenty five for, and I guarantee yeah. you that's what's going to happen. No, a hundred percent. That was a conversation I just had with a client yesterday. Cause she was like, you know, we're coming up to the area and we don't really know that much. And, you know, rates are really high right now. And she's like, you know, we, we think we, we kind of want to rent. And I was like, look, I'm not a guy that's like going to push you away from one decision or another, but we know what the market's doing right now. And I, I started asking her questions. I was like, you know, what do you think happens when, when rates go down? She's like, oh yeah, a lot of buyers enter the market. I said, yeah. And what, then what do you think happened to prices? And she's like, well, they would go up. I said, yeah. And what's happening right now in the market? She's like, well, a lot of people aren't aren't buying because rates. I said, so what does that do to inventory? She's like, well, it goes up. And I was like, well, how about prices and, and negotiation? She's like, well, you have a little bit of leverage. I said, yeah. And I was like, well, what do you think that happened to people that are like you that aren't buying? And then they still need a place to live. Where do they go? And she's like, well, they go rent. And I was like, then what do you think happened to rental prices? She's right. like, they go up. And I was like, all right, so what do you want to do? So she's coming up to look at homes to buy. And this was not like tactic to like get sleazy sales Shane out there for her to buy. It was like, Hey, these are questions you probably have not considered and questions that you probably haven't thought about. But at, at, when rates go down, like there's a lot of pent up demand, the market is going to get flooded and it's going to be very competitive again. And all and, the way back I, to like the first thing we talked about, this is the opportunity for negotiation and leverage. And I love yeah. it. And, and, and like you, it's happening down there. It's the same thing over here. Yeah. There's just not enough development. Like, I mean, in New York, there's like nothing, at least in Florida, you guys are building, right? There's development, but still mm -hmm. not at, at, at a rapid pace enough to meet the demand when rates come back down, right? Because all those people that were holding off on selling, all those people that were renting, all those people that were just literally waiting for rates to come down, all of a sudden, again, it's because it's a perception, right? They perceive that affordability is back because they see a rate. And then all of those people rush out and we see exactly what happened two and three years ago. And that's what I keep trying to tell people. You have to look back, right? Like that's the beauty of whether it's interest rates or stocks is that you can look at charts and charts don't lie. They show you what is going to happen in the future based on what has happened in the past, right? Or, or in the current market. Yep. And so if you look at the two years ago, when people thought affordability was at its highest peak, they rushed out, they went to buy. and in my opinion, a lot of them overpaid for houses. And so I would rather pay exactly what the house is worth for right now, or maybe even a little under than be in that situation where I'm paying 30, 50, 75, $100,000 for a house that I shouldn't be paying you know, that price for. For sure. And you know, just from an, an opportunist standpoint, like if you're a buyer in this market, you are 
you know, in the minority of, of what most people are trying to do. And, and the reality is people all, every day, they have to, they have to buy and they have to, you know, have a place to live. But this is, this is the most relief that I've seen in my eight year career where buyers have so much leverage and negotiating power that it's like, if you are a buyer full on, like take advantage of that. And that's kind of the, you know, along the same lines of the conversations I'm having with my clients. And now we have an additional resource to say, Hey, let's start going down this path of, getting the seller to pay 20,000 or $10,000 for your buy down. And this is what it looks like. And then that's, I think that's like the seamless win right there. So dude, appreciate your time, Raj. And thank you for spending almost an hour with me talking about this, uh, where we didn't really plan about this call, but it's definitely something I think we should, should we should bring back and do more often. Um, you're just really good on camera and a natural and clearly, you know, your shit. Cause we're like shotgunning you questions, <laughs> but, um, any like last thoughts or things you kind of want to talk about the, the, the market or anything? The last thing I just want to say is exactly what you were talking about there. See, that's why investors right now are rushing to buy because they understand that there's opportunity. When we talked about it, they understand that, hey, I can negotiate. I can I can get a price below market, right? I'm going to rush to buy. And that's why you continue to see investors all throughout the country rushing to buy. That's why you see these non qm products so popular. That's why you see private hard money lending. People that are investors that have cash are rushing out to buy because they see opportunities. And that's what buyers, you know, whether you're a first time home buyer, you have to see that as well because the you know, you're stepping back, investors are stepping forward and they're basically taking away your opportunity that you should be taking advantage of. Facts. Said from the man, Raj, I threw your, uh, your website down here. So I know you're all about the tech and, uh, I could, I could probably put your, your Instagram handle on there, but we'll put that in some of this stuff later. But if, if you follow my page, you definitely know Raj and, uh, cause we've done videos together. We collab on some stuff, but you should absolutely go check out his page and follow it. What's your handle Raj? Uh, the underscore MTG underscore expert, the mortgage expert. I didn't put, I didn't of put course, that listen, together. You know, if anyone's looking from my side, Shane's the guy, man. I, I got to tell you, I've got so many agents in New York and actually not just in New York. I'm, I'm talking about in Connecticut and all throughout the, the country that they're like, man, Shane knows his stuff and they really respect what you do out there. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the call, but these are conversations that people that look at our videos, mm -hmm. they look at it and they're like, this guy, he just, he knows his stuff, man. I give you a lot of credit about that because you're always so well informed. And even if you're not informed in an area, you're willing to learn and you're willing to grow and, and you know, again, develop it. And that's, I think, why you are really so successful. No, thank you, Raj. And um, I mean, you've been a huge component of that because I'm not, I'm a guy that's like, if I don't know, like I'm okay with saying like, I don't know. And that's how this whole conversation like started because uh, I'm not as familiar with it and I'm okay with saying, I don't know it that well, but give me a little bit of time and I'll know it better than most people because, you know, I, I absorb like a sponge and, and I'm fortunate enough to have friends like you and people that are willing to spend time uh, to jump on webinars with 43 minutes of notice and kind of help educate you know, the public about things like this. So, so thank you. All right. Well, listen, man, I appreciate it. And look, maybe they could comment and let us know what else they want us to talk about <laughs> on the next one. But yeah, no. listen, I, I'll make the time. We could do this like, you know, weekly, maybe monthly. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Weekly is a too much of a commitment. Uh, that's too, too much a Raj. I could probably do a month. We could do a monthly <laughs> one, <laughs> I like that. but I'll, I'll like go that. ahead and end this out. Uh, stay, stay in the show so we can upload things, but we did it in under an hour. That's awesome. Thank you to everyone that tuned in, watched, appreciate your comments. And I hope you guys found this Thank you helpful. My, uh, OnlyFans. Yeah. Yeah. Raj is going to get on OnlyFans. Uh, we need someone to help him with a tutorial on that. We're done. <laughs>